Chapter Ten of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Riding Whip. It was not easy for Mr. Daffy to leave his shop for the whole day, but an urgent affair called him to London, and he breakfasted early in order to catch the eight thirty train. On account of his asthma, he had to allow himself plenty of time for the walk to the station. And all would have been well, but that, just as he was polishing his silk hat and giving final directions to his assistant, in stepped a customer who came to grumble about the fit of a new coat. Ten good minutes were thus consumed, and with a painful glance at his watch, the breathless tailor at length started. The walk was uphill the sun was already powerful mr daffy reached the station with dripping forehead and panting as if his sides would burst there stood the train he had barely time to take his ticket and to rush across the platform as a porter slammed the carriage door behind him he sank upon the seat in a lamentable condition gasping coughing writhing his eyes all but started from his head and his respectable top-hat tumbled to the floor, where, unconsciously, he gave it a kick. A grotesque and distressing sight. Only one person beheld it, and this, as it happened, a friend of Mr. Daffy's. In the far corner sat a large, ruddy-cheeked man, whose eye rested upon the sufferer with a look of greeting disturbed by compassion. Mr. Lott, a timber merchant of this town, was, in every sense of the word, a more flourishing man than the asthmatic tailor. His six feet something of sound flesh and muscle, his ripe sunburned complexion, his attitude of eupeptic and broad-chested ease, left the other, by contrast, scarce his proverbial fraction of manhood. At a year or two short of fifty, Mr. Daffy began to be old, he was shoulder-bent, knee-shaky, and had a pallid, wrinkled visage with watery, pathetic eye. At fifty turned, Mr. Lott showed a vigour and a toughness such as few men of any age could rival. For a score of years the measure of Mr. Lott's robust person had been taken by Mr. Daffy's professional tape, and, without intimacy, there existed kindly relations between the two men, Neither had ever been in the other's house, but they had long met, once a week or so, at the Liberal Club, where it was their habit to play together a game of draughts. Occasionally they conversed, but it was a rather one-sided dialogue, for whereas the tailor had a sprightly intelligence and, so far as breath allowed, a ready flow of words, the timber merchant found himself at a disadvantage when mental activity was called for, the best-natured man in the world, Mr. Lott would sit smiling and content so long as he had only to listen. Asked his opinion on anything but timber, he betrayed, by a knitting of the brows, a rolling of the eyes, an inflation of the cheeks, and other signs of discomposure, the serious effort it caused him to shape a thought and to utter it. At times Mr. Daffy got on to the subject of social and political reform, and, after copious exposition, would ask what Mr. Lott thought. He knew the timber merchant too well to expect an immediate reply. There came a long pause, during which Mr. Lott snorted a little, shuffled in his chair, and stared at vacancy, until, at length, with a sudden smile of relief, he exclaimed, do you know my idea? And the idea, often rather explosively stated, was generally marked by common sense of the bull-headed British kind. Bad this morning, remarked Mr. Lott, abruptly but sympathetically, as soon as the writhing tailor could hear him. Rather bad. Ugh, ugh. Had to run. Ugh. Doesn't suit me, Mr. Lott gasped the other as he took the silk hat which his friend had picked up and stroked for him hot weather trying i vary so panted mr daffy wiping his face with a handkerchief sometimes one thing seems to suit me ugh, ugh. 
sometimes another. Going to town, Mr. Lott? Yes. The blunt affirmative was accompanied by a singular grimace, such as might have been caused by the swallowing of something very unpleasant, and thereupon followed a silence which allowed Mr. Daffy to recover himself. He sat with his eyes half-closed and head bent, leaning back. They had a general acquaintance with each other's domestic affairs. Both were widowers, both lived alone. Mr. Daffy's son was married and dwelt in London. The same formula applied to Mr. Lott's daughter. And, as it happened, the marriages had both been a subject of parental dissatisfaction. Very rarely had Mr. Lott let fall a word with regard to his daughter, Mrs. Bowles, but the townsfolk were well aware that he thought his son-in-law a fool, if not worse. Mrs. Bowles, in the seven years since her wedding, had only two or three times revisited her father's house, and her husband never came. A like reticence was maintained by Mr. Daffy concerning his son Charles Edward, once the hope of his life. At school the lad had promised well. Tailoring could not be thought of for him. He went into a solicitor's office, and remained there just long enough to assure himself that he had no turn for the law. From that day he was nothing but an expense and an anxiety to his father, until, now a couple of years ago, he announced his establishment in a prosperous business in London, of which Mr. Daffy knew nothing more than that it was connected with colonial enterprise. Since that date, Charles Edward had made no report of himself, and his father had ceased to write letters which received no reply. Presently Mr. Lott moved so as to come nearer to his travelling companion, and said in a muttering, shamefaced way, "'Have you heard any talk about my daughter lately?' Mr. Daffy showed embarrassment. "'Well, Mr. Lott, I'm sorry to say I have heard something.' "'Who from?' "'Well, it was a friend of mine, perhaps I won't mention the name, who came and told me something, something that quite upset me. That's what I'm going to town about, Mr. Lott. I'm... well, the fact is, I was going to call upon Mr. Bowles.' "'Oh, you were!' exclaimed the timber merchant, with gruffness which referred not to his friend, but to his son-in-law. "'I don't particularly want to see him, but I had thought of seeing my daughter. You wouldn't mind saying whether it was John Roper?' "'Yes, it was.' "'Then we've both heard the same story, no doubt.' Mr. Lott leaned back and stared out of the window. He kept thrusting out his lips and drawing them in again, at the same time wrinkling his forehead into the frown which signified that he was trying to shape a thought. "'Mr. Lott,' resumed the tailor, with a gravely troubled look, "'may I ask if John Roper made any mention of my son?' The timber merchant glared, and Mr. Daffy interpreted the look as one of anger, trembled under it. "'I feel ashamed and miserable,' burst from his lips, "'It's not your fault, Mr. Daffy,' interrupted the other in a good-natured growl. "'You're not responsible, no more than for any stranger.' "'That's just what I can't feel,' exclaimed the tailor, nervously slapping his knee. "'Anyway, it would be a disgrace to a man to have a son a bookmaker, a blackguard bookmaker. That's bad enough, but when it comes to robbing and ruining the friends of your own family—' "'Why, I never heard a more disgraceful thing in my life. "'How I'm going to stand in my shop and hold up my head before my customers, I do not know. "'Of course, it'll be the talk of the town. "'We know what the Ropers are when they get hold of anything. "'It'll drive me off my head, Mr. Lott, I'm sure it will.' "'The timber merchant stretched out a great hand and laid it gently on the excited man's shoulder.' "'Don't worry. That never did any good yet. "'We've got to find out, first of all, how much of Roper's story is true. "'What did he tell you?' "'He said that Mr. Bowles had been going down the hill for a year or more, "'that his business was neglected, "'that he spent his time at race courses and in public houses, "'and that the cause of it all was my son. "'My son? What had my son to do with it? 
Why, didn't I know that Charles was a racing and betting man and a notorious bookmaker? You can imagine what sort of a feeling that gave me. Roper couldn't believe it was the first I had heard of it. He said lots of people in the town knew how Charles was living. Did you know, Mr. Lott? Not I. I'm not much in the way of gossip. Well, there's what Roper said. It was last night, and what with that and my cough, I didn't get a wink of sleep after it. About three o'clock this morning I made up my mind to go to London at once and see Mr. Bowles. If it's true that he's been robbed and ruined by Charles, I've only one thing to do. My duty's plain enough. I shall ask him how much money Charles has had of him, and if my means are equal to it, I shall pay every penny back. Every penny. Mr. Lott's countenance waxed so grim that one would have thought him about to break into wrath against the speaker. But it was merely his way of disguising a pleasant emotion. "'I don't think most men would see it in that way,' he remarked gruffly. "'Whether they would or not,' exclaimed Mr. Daffy, panting and wriggling, "'it's as plain as plain could be that there's no other course for a man who respects himself.' I couldn't live a day with such a burden as that on my mind. A bookmaker, a blackguard bookmaker. To think my son should come to that. You know very well, Mr. Lott, that there's nothing I hate and despise more than horse-racing. We've often talked about it, and the harm it does, and the sin and shame it is that such doings should be permitted, haven't we? Of course we have, of course we have, returned the other with a nod. But he was absorbed in his own reflections, and gave only half an ear to the gasping vehemences which Mr. Daffy poured forth for the next ten minutes. There followed a short silence. Then the strong man shook himself and opened his lips. "'Do you know my idea?' he blurted out. "'What's that, Mr. Lott?' "'If I were you, I wouldn't go to see Bowles. Better for me to do that.' We've only gossip to go upon, and we know what that often amounts to. Leave Bowles to me, and go and see your son. But I don't even know where he's living. You don't? That's awkward. Well, then, come along with me to Bowles's place of business. As likely as not, if we find him, he'll be able to give you your son's address. What do you say to my idea, Mr. Daffy? The tailor assented to this arrangement, on condition that, if things were found to be as he had heard, he should be left free to obey his conscience. The stopping of the train at an intermediate station, where new passengers entered, put an end to the confidential talk. Mr. Daffy, breathing hard, struggled with his painful thoughts. The timber merchant, deeply meditative, let his eyes wander about the carriage. As they drew near to the London terminus, Mr. Lott bent forward to his friend. "'I want to buy a present for my eldest nephew,' he remarked. "'But I can't for the life of me think what it had better be.' "'Perhaps you'll see something in a shop window,' suggested Mr. Daffy. "'Maybe I shall.' They alighted at Liverpool Street. Mr. Lott hailed a hansom, and they were driven to a street in Southwark, where, at the entrance of a building divided into offices, one perceived the name of Bowles and Perkins. The firm was on the fifth floor, and Mr. Daffy eyed the staircase with misgiving. "'No need for you to go up,' said his companion. "'Wait here, and I'll see if I can get the address.' Mr. Lott was absent for only a few minutes. He came down again with his lips hard set, knocking each step sharply with his walking-stick. "'I've got it,' he said, and named a southern suburb. "'Have you seen Mr. Bowles?' "'No. He's out of town,' was the reply. "'Saw his partner.' They walked side by side for a short way. Then Mr. Lott stopped. "'Do you know my idea? It's a little after eleven. I'm going to see my daughter, and I dare say I shall catch the 349 home from Liverpool Street.' Suppose we take our chance of meeting there. Thus it was agreed. Mr. Daffy turned in the direction of his son's abode, 
the timber merchant went northward and presently reached finsbury park where in a house of unpretentious but decent appearance dwelt mr bowles the servant who answered the door wore a strange look as if something had alarmed her she professed not to know whether any one was at home and on going to inquire shut the door on the visitor's face a few minutes elapsed before mr lott was admitted the hall struck him as rather bare and at the entrance of the drawing-room he stopped in astonishment for excepting the window curtains and a few ornaments the room was quite unfurnished at the far end stood a young woman her hands behind her and her head bent an attitude indicative of distress or shame are you moving jane inquired mr lott eyeing her curiously his daughter looked at him she had a comely face with no little of the paternal character stamped upon it her knitted brows and sullen eyes bespoke a perturbed humour and her voice was only just audible yes we are moving father mr lott's heavy footfall crossed the floor he planted himself before her his hands resting on his stick what's the matter jane where's bowles he left town yesterday he'll be back to-morrow i think you've had the brokers in the house isn't that it eh mrs bowles made no answer but her head sank again and a trembling of her shoulders betrayed the emotion with which she strove knowing that jane would tell of her misfortunes only when and how she chose the father turned away and stood for a minute or two at the window then he asked abruptly whether there was not such a thing as a chair in the house mrs bowles who had been on the point of speaking bade him come to another room it was the dining-room but all the appropriate furniture had vanished a couple of bedroom chairs and a deal table served for present necessities here when they had both sat down mrs bowles found courage to break the silence arthur doesn't know of it he went away yesterday morning and the men came in the afternoon he had a promise a distinct promise that this shouldn't be done before the end of the month by then he hoped to have money who's the creditor inquired mr lott with a searching look at her face mrs bowles was mute her eyes cast down is it charles daffy still his daughter kept silence i thought so said the timber merchant and clumped on the floor with his stick you'd better tell me all about it jane i know something already better let us talk it over my girl and see what can be done he waited a moment then his daughter tried to speak with difficulty overcame a sob and at length began her story she would not blame her husband he had been unlucky in speculations and was driven to a money-lender his acquaintance charles daffy this man a heartless rascal had multiplied charges and interest on a small sum originally borrowed until it became a crushing debt he held a bill of sale on most of their furniture and yesterday as if he knew of bowles's absence had made the seizure he was within his legal rights but he had led the debtor to suppose that he would not exercise them thus far did jane relate in a hard matter-of-fact voice but with many nervous movements her father listened in grim silence and when she ceased appeared to reflect that's your story he said of a sudden now what about the horse-racing i know nothing of horse-racing was the cold reply bowles keeps all that to himself does he we'd better have our talk out jane now that we've begun better tell me all you know girl again there was a long pause but mr lott had patience and his dogged persistency at length overcame the wife's pride yes it was true that bowles had lost money at races he had been guilty of much selfish folly but the ruin it had brought upon him would serve as a lesson he was a wretched and a penitent man a few days ago he had confessed everything to his wife 
and besought her to pardon him. At present he was making desperate efforts to recover an honest footing. The business might still be carried on if someone could be induced to put a little capital into it. With that in view, Bowles had gone to see certain relatives of his in the north. If his hope failed, she did not know what was before them. They had nothing left now but their clothing and the furniture of one or two rooms. "'Would you like to come back home for a while?' asked Mr. Lott abruptly. "'No, father,' was the not less abrupt reply. "'I couldn't do that.' "'I'll give no money to Bulls. "'He has never asked you, and never will.' "'Mr. Lott glared and glowered, "'but with all that had something in his face "'which hinted softness. "'The dialogue did not continue much longer. "'It ended with a promise from Mrs. Bulls "'to let her father know "'whether her husband succeeded or not "'in re-establishing himself. "'Thereupon they shook hands without a word, and Mr. Lott left the house. He returned to the city, and, it being now nearly two o'clock, made a hearty meal. When he was in the street again, he remembered the birthday present he wished to buy for his nephew, and for half an hour he rambled vaguely, staring into window shops. At length something caught his eye. It was a row of riding whips, mounted in silver. "'Just the thing,' he said to himself, "'to please a lad who would perhaps ride to hounds next winter. "'He stepped in, chose carefully, and made the purchase. "'Then, having nothing left to do, "'he walked at a leisurely pace towards the railway station. "'Mr. Daffy was there before him. "'They met at the entrance to the platform "'from which their train would start. "'Must you go back by this?' asked the tailor. My son wasn't at home, and won't be, till about five o'clock. I should be terribly obliged, Mr. Lott, if you could stay and go to Clapham with me. Is it asking too much? The timber merchant gave a friendly nod, and said it was all the same to him. He made brief report of what he had learnt at Finsby Park. Mr. Daffy was beside himself with wrath and shame. He would pay every farthing if he had to sell all he possessed. I'm so glad and so thankful you will come with me, Mr. Lott. He care nothing for what I said, but when he sees you and hears your opinion of him, it may have some effect. I beg you to tell him your mind plainly. Let him know what a contemptible wretch, what a dirty blackguard he is in the eyes of all decent folk. Let him know it, I entreat you. Perhaps even yet it isn't too late to make him ashamed of himself. They stood amid a rush of people. The panting tailor clung to his big companion's sleeve. Gruffly promising to do what he could, Mr. Lott led the way into the street again, where they planned the rest of their day. By five o'clock they were at Clapham. Charles Daffy occupied the kind of house which is known as eminently respectable. It suggested an income of at least a couple thousand a year. As they waited for the door to open, Mr. Lott smote gently on his leg with the new riding whip. He had been silent and meditative all the way hither. A smart maidservant conducted them to the dining room, and there, in a minute or two, they were joined by Mr. Charles. No one could have surmised from this gentleman's appearance that he was the son of the little tradesman who stood before him. Nature had given the younger Mr. Daffy a tall and shapely person, and experience of life had refined his manners to an easy assurance he would never have learned from his paternal example. His smooth-shaven visage, so long as it remained grave, might have been that of an acute and energetic lawyer. His smile, however, disturbed this impression, for it had a twinkling insolence, a raffish facetiousness, incompatible with any sober quality. He wore the morning dress of a city man, with collar and necktie of the latest fashion. His watchguard was rather demonstrative, and he had two very solid rings on his left hand. "'Ah, Dad, how do you do?' 
he exclaimed, on entering, in an affected head voice. "'Why, what's the matter?' Mr. Daffy had drawn back, refusing the offered hand. With an unpleasant smile, Charles turned to his other visitor. "'Mr. Lott, isn't it? You're looking very well, Mr. Lott. But I suppose you didn't come here just to give me the pleasure of seeing you. I'm rather a busy man.' "'Perhaps one or the other of you will be good enough to break this solemn silence "'and let me know what your game is.' "'He spoke with careless impertinence and let himself drop onto a chair. "'The others remained standing, and Mr. Daffy broke into vehement speech. "'I have come here, Charles, to ask what you mean by disgracing yourself and dishonouring my name. "'Only yesterday, for the first time, I heard of the life you are leading.' Is this how you repay me for all the trouble I took to have you well educated and to make you an honest man? Here I find you living in luxury and extravagance. And how? On stolen money. Money as much stolen as if you were a pickpocket or a burglar. A pleasant thing for me to have to tell my friends, to have all my friends talking about Charles Daffy, the bookmaker and the moneylender, what right have you to dishonour your father in this way? I ask, what right have you, Charles? Here the speaker, who had struggled to gasp his last sentence, was overcome with a violent fit of coughing. He tottered back and sank on to a sofa. Are you here to look after him? asked Charles of Mr. Lott, crossing his legs and nodding toward the sufferer. "'If so, I advise you to take him away before he does himself harm. "'You're a lot bigger than he is, and perhaps have more sense.' "'The timber merchant stood with his legs slightly apart, "'holding his stick and riding whip horizontally with both hands. "'His eyes were fixed upon young Mr. Daffy, "'and his lips moved in rather an ominous way, "'but he made no reply to Charles's smiling remark. "'Mr. Lott?' said the tailor, in a voice still broken by pants and coughs. "'Will you speak, or me? Will you say what you think of him?' "'You'll have to be quick about it,' interposed Charles, with a glance at his watch. "'I can give you five minutes. You can say a lot in that time, if you're sound of wind.' The timber merchant's eyes were very wide, and his cheeks unusually red. Abruptly he turned to Mr. Daffy. "'Do you know my idea?' "'But just as he spoke there sounded a knock at the door, "'and the smart maid-servant cried out that a gentleman wished to see her master. "'Who is it?' asked Charles. "'The answer came from the visitor himself, "'who, pushing the servant aside, broke into the room. "'It was a young man of no very distinguished appearance, "'thin, red-haired, with a pasty complexion and a scrubby moustache. His clothes were approaching shabbiness, and he had an unwashed look, due in part to hasty travel on this hot day. Streaming with sweat, his features distorted with angry excitement, he shouted as he entered, "'You've got to see me, Daffy. I won't be refused.' In the same moment, his glance discovered the two visitors, and he stopped short. "'Mr. Lott, you here? I'm glad of it. I'm awfully glad of it. I couldn't have wished anything better.' I don't know who this other gentleman is, but it doesn't matter. I'm glad to have witnesses. I'm infernally glad. Mr. Lott, you've been to my house this morning. You know what's happened there. I had to go out of town yesterday, and this Daffy, this cursed liar and swindler, used the opportunity to sell up my furniture. He'll tell you he had a legal right, but he gave me his word not to do anything till the end of the month and in any case i don't really owe him half the sum he has down against me i've paid that black-hearted scoundrel hundreds of pounds honourably paid him debts of honour and now he has the face to charge me sixty per cent on money i was fool enough to borrow from him sixty per cent what do you think of that mr lott what do you think of it sir i'm sorry to say it doesn't at all surprise me "'answered Mr. Daffy, who perceived that the speaker was Mr. Lott's son-in-law. "'But I can't sympathize with you very much. "'If you have dealings with a bookmaker, 
"'A blackleg, a blackleg!' shouted Bowles. "'Bookmakers are respectable men in comparison with him. "'He's bled me, the brute. "'He tempted me on and on. "'Look here, Mr. Lott. "'I know as well as you do that I've been an infernal fool. "'I've had my eyes opened now that it's too late. "'I hear my wife told you that, and I'm glad she did. "'I've been a fool, yes, but I fell into the hands of the greatest scoundrel unhung, "'and he's ruined me. "'You heard from Jane what I was gone about.' it's no good i came back by the first train this morning without a mouthful of breakfast it's all up with me i'm a cursed beggar and that thief is the cause of it and he comes into my house no better than a burglar and lays his hands on everything that'll bring money where's the account of that sale you liar i'll go to the magistrate about this charles daffy sat in a reposeful attitude the scene amused him he chuckled inwardly from time to time but of a sudden his aspect changed he started up and spoke with a snarling emphasis i've had just about enough look here clear out all of you there's the door go mr daffy moved towards him is that how you speak to your father charles he exclaimed indignantly yes it is take your hook with the others i'm sick of your tommy rot then listen to me before i go cried mr daffy his short and awkward figure straining in every muscle for the dignity of righteous wrath i don't know whether you are more of a fool or a knave perhaps you really think that there is as much to be said for your way of earning a living as for any other i hope you do for it's a cruel thing to suppose that my son has turned out a shameless scoundrel let me tell you then this business of yours is one that moves every honest and sensible man to anger and disgust it matters nothing whether you keep the rules of the blackguard game or whether you cheat the difference between bookmaker and blackleg is so small that it isn't worth talking about you live by the plunder of people who are foolish and vicious enough to fall into your clutches you're an enemy of society that's the plain truth of it as much an enemy of society as the forger or the burglar you live and live in luxury by the worst vice of our time the vice which is rotting english life the vice which will be our national ruin if it goes on much longer when you were a boy you've heard me many a time say all i thought about racing and betting you've heard me speak with scorn of the high-placed people who set so vile an example to the classes below them if i could have foreseen that you would sink to such disgrace charles was standing in an attitude of contemptuous patience he looked at his watch and interjected a remark i can only allow your eloquence one minute and a half more that will be enough replied his father sternly the only thing i have to add is that all the money you have stolen from mr bowles i as a simple duty shall repay you're no longer a boy in the eye of the law i am not responsible for you but for very shame i must make good the wrong you have done in this case i couldn't stand in my shop day by day and know that everyone was saying there's the man whose son ruined mr lott's son-in-law and sold up his home unless i had done all i could to repair the mischief i shall ask mr bowles for a full account of what he has lost to you and if it's in my power every penny shall be made good he thank goodness seems to have learnt his lesson that i have mr daffy that i have cried bowles there's not much fear that he'll fall into your clutches again and i hope i most earnestly hope that before you can do much more harm you'll overreach yourself and the law stupid as it is will get hold of you remember the father i was charles and think what it means that the best wish i can now form for you is that you may come to public disgrace does no one applaud asked charles looking around the room that's rather unkind seeing how the speaker has blown himself be off dad and don't fool any longer bowles take your hook mr lott charles met the eye of the timber merchant and was unexpectedly mute 
"'Well, sir,' said Mr. Lott, regarding him fixedly, "'and what have you to say to me?' "'Only that my time is too valuable to be wasted,' continued the other, with an impatient gesture. "'Be good enough to leave my house.' "'Mr. Lott,' said the tailor, in an exhausted voice, "'I apologize to you for my son's rudeness. "'I gave you the trouble of coming here, hoping it might shame him. "'But I'm afraid it's been no good. Let us go.' "'Mr. Lott regarded him mildly. "'Mr. Daffy,' he said, "'if you don't mind, I should like to have a word in private with your son. "'Do you and Mr. Bowles go on to the station and wait for me? "'Perhaps I shall catch you up before you get there.' "'I have told you already, Mr. Lott,' shouted Charles, "'that I can waste no more time on you. "'I refuse to talk with you at all.' "'And I, Mr. Charles Daffy,' was the resolute answer, "'refuse to leave this room till I have had a word with you.' "'What do you want to say?' asked Charles brutally. "'Just to let you know an idea of mine,' was the reply, "'an idea that's come to me whilst I've stood here listening.' The tailor and Mr. Bowles moved towards the door. Charles glanced at them fiercely and insolently, then turned his look again upon the other man who remained. The other two passed out, the door closed. Mr. Lott, stick and riding whip still held horizontally, seemed to be lost in meditation. Now, blurted Charles, what is it? Mr. Lott regarded him steadily and spoke with his wonted deliberation. "'You heard what your father said about paying that money back?' "'Of course I heard. He's idiot enough. Do you know my idea, young man? You'd better do the honest thing and repay it yourself.' Charles stared for a moment, then sputtered a laugh. "'That's your idea, is it, Mr. Lott? Well, it isn't mine, so good morning.' Again the timber merchant seemed to meditate. His eyes wandered from Charles to the dining-room table. "'Just a minute more,' he resumed. "'I have another idea, not a new one, an idea that came to me long ago when your father first began to have trouble about you. I happened to be in the shop one day. It was when you were living idly at your father's expense, young man.' and I heard you speak to him in what I call a confoundedly impertinent way. Thinking it over afterwards, I said to myself, if I had a son who spoke to me like that, I'd give him the soundest thrashing he'd be ever likely to get. That was my idea, young man, and as I stood listening to you today, came back into my mind. Your father can't thrash you, he hasn't the brawn for it. But as it's nothing less than a public duty, somebody must, and so... Charles, who had been watching every movement of the speaker's face, suddenly sprang forward, making for the door. But Mr. Lott had foreseen this. With astonishing alertness and vigour, he intercepted the fugitive, seized him by the scruff of the neck, and, after a moment's struggle, pinned him face downwards across the end of the table. His stick he had thrown aside, the riding whip he held between his teeth. So brief was this conflict that there sounded only a scuffling of feet on the floor, and a growl of fury from Charles as he found himself handled like an infant. Then, during some two minutes, one might have thought that a couple of very strenuous carpet-beaters were at work in the room. For the space of a dozen switches, Charles strove frantically with wild kicks, which wounded only the air, but all in silence. Gripped only the more tightly, he at length uttered a yell of pain, followed by curses hot and swift. Still, the carpet-beaters seemed to be at work, and more vigorously than ever. Charles began to roar. As it happened, there were only servants in the house. When the clamour had lasted long enough to be really alarming, knocks sounded at the door, which at length was thrown open, and the startled face of a domestic appeared. At the same moment Mr. Lott, his right arm being weary, 
brought the castigatory exercise to an end. Charles rolled to his feet and began to strike out furiously with both fists. "'Just as you like, young man,' said the timber merchant, as he coolly warded off the blows. "'If you wish to have it this way, too, but I warn you it isn't a fair match.' "'Sally, shut the door and go about your business.' "'Shall I fetch a policeman, sir?' shrilled the servant. Her master, sufficiently restored to his senses to perceive that he had not the least chance in a pugilistic encounter with Mr. Lott, drew back and seemed to hesitate. "'Answer the girl,' said Mr. Lott, as he picked up his whip and examined its condition. "'Shall we have a policeman in?' "'Shut the door!' Charles shouted fiercely. The men gazed at each other. Daffy was pale and quivering, his hair in disorder, his waistcoat torn open, collar and necktie twisted into rags. He made a pitiful figure. The timber merchant was slightly heated, but his countenance wore an expression of calm contentment. "'For the present,' remarked Mr. Lott, as he took up his hat and stick, "'I think our business is at an end.' It isn't often that a fellow of your sort gets his deserts, and I'm rather sorry we didn't have the policeman in. A report of the case might do good. I bid you good day, young man. If I were you, I'd sit quiet for an hour or two and just reflect. You've a lot to think about. So, with a pleasant smile, the visitor took his leave. As he walked away, he again examined the riding whip. "'It isn't often a thing happens so luckily,' he said to himself. First-rate whip. Hardly a bit damaged. Harry'll like it none the worse for my having handled it.' At the station he found Mr. Daffy and Bowles, who regarded him with questioning looks. "'Nothing to be got out of him,' said Mr. Lott. "'Bowles, I want to talk with you and Jane. It'll be best, perhaps, if I go back home with you.' "'Mr. Daffy, sorry we can't travel down together. "'You'll catch the eight o'clock.' "'I hope you told him plainly what you thought of him,' said Mr. Daffy, in a voice of indignant shame. "'I did,' answered the timber merchant. "'And I don't think he's very likely to forget it.'" End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories》by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Fate and the Apothecary》Farmillo, chemist by examination. So did the good man proclaim himself to a suburb of a city in the west of England. It was one of those pretty, clean, fresh-coloured suburbs only to be found in the West. A few dainty little shops, everything about them bright or glistening, scattered among pleasant little houses with gardens eternally green and all but perennially in bloom. Every vista ending in foliage, and in one direction a far glimpse of the cathedral towers, sending forth their music to fall dreamily upon those quiet roads. The neighbourhood seemed to breathe a tranquil prosperity. Red-cheeked emissaries of butcher, baker, and grocer, order book in hand, knocked cheerily at kitchen doors, and went smiling away. The ponies they drove were well-fed and frisky, their carts spick and span. The church of the parish, an imposing edifice, dated only from a few years ago, and had cost its noble founder a sum of money which any church-going parishioner would have named to you with proper awe. The population was largely female, and every shopkeeper who knew his business had become proficient in bowing, smiling, and suave servility. Mr. Farmelow, it is to be feared, had no very profound acquaintance with his business from any point of view. 
True, he was chemist by examination, but it had cost him repeated efforts to reach this unassailable ground, and more than one pharmaceutist with whom he abode as assistant had felt it a measure of prudence to dispense with his services. Give him time, and he was generally equal to the demands of suburban customers. Hurry or interrupt him, and he showed himself anything but the man for a crisis. Face and demeanour were against him. He had exceedingly plain features, and a persistently sour expression. Even his smile suggested sarcasm. He could not tune his voice to the tradesman note, and on the slightest provocation he became quite unintentionally offensive. Such a man has no chance whatever in this flowery and bowery little suburb. Yet he came hither with hopes. One circumstance seemed to him especially favourable. The shop was also a post-office, and no one could fail to see. It was put most impressively by the predecessor who sold him the business. How advantageous was this blending of public service with commercial interest! especially as there was no telegraphic work to make a skilled assistant necessary. As a matter of course, people using the post office would patronize the chemist, and a provincial chemist can add to his legitimate business sundry pleasant little tradings which benefit himself without provoking the jealousy of neighbor shopmen. It will be your own fault, my dear sir, if you do not make a very good thing of it indeed. The sole and sufficient explanation of, of the decline during this last year or two is my shocking health. Necessarily, Mr. Farmelo entered into negotiation with the postal authorities, and it was with some little disappointment that he learnt how very modest could be his direct remuneration for the responsibilities and labours he undertook. The post office is a very shrewdly managed department of the public service. It has brought to perfection the art of obtaining maximum results with a minimum expenditure. But Mr. Farmelow remembered the other aspect of the matter. He would benefit so largely by this ill-paid undertaking that grumbling was foolish. Moreover, the thing carried dignity with it. He served His Majesty. He served the nation. And, ha ha, how very odd it would be to post one's letters in one's own post office. One might really get a good deal of amusement out of the thought, after business hours. His age was eight and thirty. For some years he had pondered matrimony, though without fixing his affections on any particular person. It was plain, indeed, that he ought to marry. Every tradesman is made more respectable by wedlock, and a chemist who, in some degree, resembles a medical man, seems especially to stand in need of the matrimonial guarantee. Had it been feasible, Mr. Farmelo would have brought a wife with him from town, where he had lived for the past few years. But he was in the difficult position of knowing not a single marriageable female to whom he could address himself with hope or with self-respect. Natural shyness had always held him aloof from reputable women. He felt that he could not recommend himself to them. He, who had such an unlucky aptitude for saying the wrong word or keeping silence when speech was demanded. With the men of his acquaintance he could relieve his sense of awkwardness and deficiency by becoming aggressive. In fact, he had a reputation for cantankerousness, for pugnacity, which kept most of his equals in some awe of him, and to perceive this was one solace amid many discontents. Nicely dressed and well-spoken and good-looking women above the class of domestic servants he worshipped from afar, and only in vivacious moments pictured himself as the wooer of such a superior being. It seemed as though fate could do nothing with Mr. Formelow, 
At six and thirty he suffered the shock of learning that a relative, an old woman to whom he had occasionally written as a matter of kindness, Farmerlow could do such things, had left him by will the sum of six hundred pounds. It was strictly a shock. It upset his health for several days, and not for a week or two could he realise the legacy as a fact. Just when he was beginning to look about him with a new air of confidence, the solicitors who were managing the little affair for him dryly acquainted him with the fact that his relative's will was contested by other kinsfolk whom the old woman had passed over, on the ground that she was imbecile and incapable of conducting her affairs. There followed a lawsuit which consumed many months and cost a good deal of money so that, though he won his case, Mr. Farmelow lost all satisfaction in his improved circumstances, and was only more embittered against the world at large. No sooner had he purchased his business than he learnt from smiling neighbours that he had paid considerably too much for it. His predecessor, beyond a doubt, would have taken very much less had, indeed, been on the point of doing so, just when Mr. Farmelow appeared. This kind of experience is a trial to any man. It threw Mr. Farmelow into a silent rage, with the result that two or three customers who chanced to enter his shop declared that they would never have anything more to do with such a surly creature. And now began his torment a form of exasperation peculiar to his dual capacity of shopkeeper and manager of a post-office. All day long he stood on the watch for customers, literally stood, now behind the counter, now in front of it, his eager and angry eyes turning to the door whenever the steps of a passer-by sounded without. If the door opened, his nerves began to tingle, and he straightened himself like a soldier at attention. For a moment he suffered an agony of doubt. Would the person entering turn to the counter or to the post-office? And seldom was his hope fulfilled. Not one in four of the people who came in was a genuine customer. The post-office. Always the post-office. A stamp, a card, a newspaper wrapper, a postal order a letter to be registered, anything but an honest purchase across the counter, or the blessed tendering of a prescription to make up. From vexation he passed to annoyance, to rage, to fury. He cursed the post office, and committed to eternal perdition the man who had waxed eloquent upon its advantages. Of course he had hired an errand-boy, and never had errand boy so little legitimate occupation. Resolving not to pay him for nothing, Mr. Farmelow kept him cleaning windows, washing bottles, and the like, until the lad fairly broke into rebellion. If this was the sort of work he was engaged for, he must have higher wages. He wasn't over-strong, and his mother said he must lead an open-air life. That was why he had taken the place. To be bearded thus in his own shop was too much for Mr. Farmelow. He seized the opportunity of giving his wrath full swing, and burst into a frenzy of vilification. Just as his passion reached its height, he stood with his back to the door, there entered a lady who wished to make a large purchase of disinfectants. Alarmed and scandalized at what was going on, she had no sooner crossed the threshold than she turned again and hurried away. Her friends were not long in learning from her that the new chemist was a most violent man, a most disagreeable person, the very last man one could think of doing business with. The home was but poorly furnished, and Mr. Farmelow had engaged a very cheap general servant who involved him in dirt and discomfort. It was a matter of talk among the neighbouring tradesmen that the chemist lived in a beggarly fashion. 
when the dismissed errand boy spread the story of how he had been used people jumped to the conclusion that mr farmiloe drank before long there was a legend that he had been suffering from an acute attack of delirium tremens the post office always the post office if he sat down at a meal the shop bell clanged and hope springing eternal he hurried forth in readiness to make up a packet or concoct a mixture but it was an old lady who held him in talk for ten minutes about rates of postage to south america when by rare luck he had a prescription to dispense the hideous scrawl of that pestilent dr bunker in came somebody with letters and parcels which he was requested to weigh and his hand shook so with rage that he could not resume his dispensing for the next quarter of an hour people asked extraordinary questions and were surprised offended when he declared he could not answer them when could a letter be delivered at a village on the northwest coast of ireland was it true that the post office contemplated a reduction of rates to hong kong would he explain in detail the new system of express delivery invariably he betrayed impatience and occasionally he lost his temper people went away exclaiming what a horrid man he was mr what's your name said a shopkeeper one day after receiving a short answer i shall make it my business to complain of you to the postmaster-general terror stole upon the chemist's heart i didn't mean it and i i'm sure i apologize it's a way i have a damned bad way let me tell you i advise you to get out of it i'm sorry so you should be and the tradesman walked off only half appeased mr farmiloe could have shed tears in his mortification and for some minutes he stood looking at a bottle of laudanum wishing he had the courage to have done with life plainly he could not live very long unless things improved his ready money was coming to an end rents and taxes loomed before him an awful thought of bankruptcy haunted him in the early morning hours the most frequent visitor to the post-office was a well-dressed middle-aged man who spoke civilly and did his business in the fewest possible words mr farmiloe rather liked the look of him and once or twice made conversational overtures but with no encouraging result one day feeling bolder than usual the chemist ventured to speak what he had in mind after supplying the grave gentleman with stamps and postal orders he said in a tone meant to be conciliatory i don't know whether you have ever need of mineral waters sir why yes sometimes my ordinary tradesman supplies them i thought i'd just mention that i keep them in stock ah thank you i've noticed went on the luckless apothecary his bosom heaving with a sense of his wrongs that you're a pretty large customer of the post office and it seems to me he meant to speak jocosely that it would be only fair if you gave me a turn now and again i get next to nothing out of this you know i should be much obliged if you the man of few words was looking at him half in surprise half in indignation and when the chemist blundered into silence he spoke i really have nothing to do with that as a matter of fact i was on the point of making a little purchase in your shop but i decidedly object to this kind of behaviour and shall make my purchase elsewhere he strode solemnly into the street and mr farmiloe unconscious of all about him glared at vacancy whether from the angry tradesman or from some lady with whom mr farmiloe had been abrupt a complaint did presently reach the postal authorities with the result that an official called at the chemist's shop the interview was rather unpleasant 
it happened that Mr. Farmelow, not for the first time, had just then allowed himself to run out of certain things always in demand by the public, halfpenny stamps, for instance. Moreover, his accounts were not in perfect order. This, he had to hear, was emphatically unbusinesslike, and, in brief, would not do. "'It shall not occur again, sir,' mumbled the unhappy man. "'But if you consider my position, Mr. Farmelow, "'allow me to tell you that this is a matter for your own consideration "'and no one else's.' "'True, sir, quite true. "'Still, when you come to think of it, I assure you, "'the only assurance I want is that the business of the post-office "'will be properly attended to.' and that assurance I must have. I shall probably call again before long. Good morning. It was always with a savage satisfaction that Mr. Farmelow heard the clock strike eight on Saturday evening. His shop remained open till ten, but at eight came the end of the post-office business. If, as happened, anyone entered five minutes too late, it delighted him to refuse their request. These were the only moments in which he felt himself a free man. After eating his poor supper, he smoked a pipe or two of cheap tobacco, brooding, or he fingered the pages of his menacing account books, or, very rarely, he walked about the dark country roads asking himself, with many tragicomic gesture and ejaculation, why he could not get on like other men. One afternoon it seemed that he, at length, had his chance. There entered a maid-servant with a prescription to be made up and sent as soon as possible. A glance at the name delighted Mr. Farmelow. It was that of the richest family in the suburbs. The medicine, to be sure, was only for a governess, but his existence was recognized, and the patronage of such people would do him good. But for the never-sufficiently-to-be-condemned handwriting of Dr. Bunker, the prescription offered no difficulty. Rubbing his palms together, and smiling as he seldom smiled, he told the domestic that the medicine should be delivered in less than half an hour. Scarcely had he begun upon it when a lady came in, a lady whom he knew well. Her business was at the post-office side, and she looked a peremptory demand for his attention. Inwardly furious, he crossed the shop. "'Be so good as to tell me what this will cost by book-post.' It seemed to be a pamphlet. Giving a glance at one of the open ends, Mr. Farmelow saw handwriting within, and his hostility to the woman found vent in a sharp remark. "'There's a written communication in this. It will be letter-rate.' The lady eyed him with terrible scorn. "'You will oblige me by minding your own business. Your remark is the merest impertinence.' That packet consists of manuscript, and will therefore go at book rate. Be so good as to weigh it at once. Mr. Farmelow lost all control of himself, and well-nigh screamed. No, madam, I will not weigh it, and let me inform you, as you are so ignorant, that to weigh packages is not part of my duty. I do it merely to oblige civil persons, and you, madam, are not one of them. The lady instantly turned and withdrew. "'Damn the post-office!' yelled Mr. Farmelow, alone with his errand-boy, and shaking his fist in the air. "'This very day I write to give it up. I say damn the post-office!' He returned to his dispensing, completed it, wrapped up the bottle in the customary manner, and dispatched the boy to the house. Five minutes later, a thought flashed through his mind, which put him in a cold sweat. He happened to glance along the shelf from which he had taken the bottle containing the last ingredient of the mixture, and it struck him, with all the force of a horrible doubt, 
that he had made a mistake. In the irate confusion of his thoughts, he had done the dispensing almost mechanically. The bottle he ought to have taken down was that, but had he not actually poured from that other? Of poisoning there was no fear, but if indeed he had made a slip, the result would be a very extraordinary mixture, so surprising, in fact, that the patient would be sure to speak to Dr. Bunker about it. Good heavens! He felt sure he had made the mistake. Any other man would have taken down the two bottles in question and have examined the mouths of them for traces of moisture. Mr. Farmelow, a victim of destiny, could do nothing so reasonable. Heedless of the fact that his shop remained unguarded, he seized his hat and rushed after the errand boy. If he could only have a sniff at the mixture, it would either confirm his fear or set his mind at rest. He tore along the road and was too late. The boy met him, having just completed his errand. With a wild curse, he sped to the house he rushed to the tradesman's door. The medicine just delivered, he must examine it. He feared there was a mistake, an extraordinary oversight. The bottle had not yet been upstairs. Mr. Farmerlow tore off the wrapper, wrenched out the cork, sniffed, and smiled feebly. Thank you. I'm glad to find there was no mistake. I'll take it back and have it wrapped up again, and send it immediately, immediately. And, by the by, he fumbled in his pocket for a half-crown, still smiling like a detected culprit, I'm sure you won't mention this little affair. A new assistant of mine, stupid fellow. I am going to get rid of him at once. Thank you, thank you. Notwithstanding that half-crown, the incident was, of course, talked of throughout the house before a quarter-hour had elapsed. Next day it was the gossip of the suburb, and the day after the city itself heard the story. People were alarmed and scandalized. Why, such a chemist was a public danger! One lady declared that he ought at once to be struck off the roll. And so, in a sense, he was. Another month, and the flowery, bowery little suburb knew him no more. He hid himself in a great town, living on the wreck of his fortune, whilst he sought a place as an assistant. A leaky pair of boots and a bad east wind found the vulnerable spot of his constitution. After all, there was just enough money left to bury him. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of The House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Topham's Chance。Chapter 1 。On a summer afternoon, two surly men sat together in a London lodging. One of them occupied an easy chair, smoked a cigarette, and read the newspaper. The other was seated at the table with a mass of papers before him, on which he laboured as though correcting exercises. They were much of an age, at that about thirty, but whereas the idler was well dressed his companion had a seedy appearance and looked altogether like a man who neglected himself for half an hour they had not spoken of a sudden the man in the chair jumped up well i'll have to go into town he said gruffly and it's uncertain when i shall get back get that stuff cleared off and reply to the urgent letters mind you write in the proper tone to dixon as soapy as you can make it. Tell Miss Brewer we can't reduce the fees, but that will give her credit for a month. Guarantee the Leicestershire fellow a pass if he begins at once. The other, who listened, bit the end of his wooden penholder to splinters. All right, he replied, but look here, I want a little money. So do I, 
"'Yes, but you're not like me without a coin in your pocket. "'Look here, give me half a crown. "'I have absolute need of it. "'Why, I can't even get my hair cut. "'I'm sick of this slavery.' "'Then go and do better,' cried the well-dressed man insolently. "'You were glad enough of the job when I offered it to you. "'It's no good you're looking to me for money. "'I can do no more myself than just live. "'And as soon as I see a chance, you may be sure I shall clear out of this rotten business.' "'He moved towards the door, but before opening it stood hesitating. "'Want to get your hair cut, do you? "'Well, there's sixpence. It's all I can spare.' The door closed, and the man at the table, leaning back, stared gloomily at the sixpence piece on the table before him. His name was Topham. He had a university degree and a damaged reputation. Six months ago, when his choice seemed to be between staying in the streets and turning sandwich man, luck had made him acquainted with Mr. Rudolph Starkey who wrote himself M.A. of Dublin University, and advertised a system of tuition by correspondence. In return for mere board and lodging, Topham became Mr. Starkey's assistant. That is to say, he did by far the greater part of Mr. Starkey's work. The tutorial business was but moderately successful. Still, it kept its proprietor in cigarettes and enabled him to pass some hours a day at a club, where he was convinced that before long some better chance in life would offer itself to him. Having always been a lazy dog, Starkey regarded himself as an example of industry unrewarded. Being as selfish a fellow as one could meet, he reproached himself with the unworldliness of his nature, which had so hindered him in a basely material age. One of his ventures was a half-moral, half-practical little volume entitled Success in Life. Had it been either more moral or more practical, this book would probably have yielded him a modest income, for such works are dear to the British public, but Rudolf Starkey, M.A., was one of those men who do everything by halves, and snarl over the ineffectual results. Topham's fault was that of a man who had followed his instincts but too thoroughly. They brought him to an end of everything, and, as Starkey said, he had been glad enough to take the employment which was offered without any inconvenient inquiries. The work which he undertook he did competently and honestly for some time without a grumble beginning with a certain gratitude to his employer though without any liking he soon grew to detest the man and had much ado to keep up a show of decent civility in their intercourse of better birth and breeding than starkey he burned with resentment at the scant ceremony with which he was treated and loathed the meanness which could exact so much toil for such poor remuneration when offering his terms, Starkey had talked in that bland way characteristic of him, with strangers. I'm really ashamed to propose nothing better to a man of your standing, but, well, I'm making a start, you see, and the fact of the matter is, just at present, I could very well manage to do all the work myself. Still, if you think it worth while, there's no doubt we shall get on capitally together and of course i need not say as soon as our progress justifies it we must come to new arrangements a matter of six or seven hours a day will be all i shall ask of you at present for my own part i work chiefly at night chapter two by the end of the first month topham was working not six or seven but ten or twelve hours a day and his spells of labour only lengthened as time went on. Seeing himself victimised, he one day alluded to the promise of better terms. But Starkey turned sour. "'You surprise me, Topham. Here are we, practically partners, doing our best to make this thing a success, and all at once you spring upon me an unreasonable demand. You know how expensive these rooms are, for we must have a decent address.' If you are dissatisfied, say so, and give me time to look out for someone else. Topham was afraid of the street, and that his employer well knew, 
the conversation ended in mutual sullenness, which thenceforward became the note of their colloquies. Starkey felt himself a victim of ingratitude, and consequently threw even more work upon his helpless assistant. That the work was so conscientiously done did not at all astonish him. Now and then he gave himself the satisfaction of finding fault, just to remind Topham that his bread depended on another's good will. Congenial indolence grew upon him, but he talked only the more of his ceaseless exertions. Sometimes in the evening he would throw up his arms, yawn wearily, and declare that so much toil with such paltry results was a heart-breaking thing. Topham stared sullenly at the sixpence. This was but the latest of many insults, yet never before had he so tasted the shame of his subjection. Though he was earning a living, and a right to self-respect, more strenuously than Starkey ever had, this fellow made him feel like a mendicant. His nerves quivered. He struck the table fiercely, shouting within himself, Brute! Cad! Then he pocketed the coin and got on with his duties. It was a toil of peculiarly wearisome and enervating kind. Starkey's advertisements, which were chiefly in the county newspapers, put him in communication with persons of both sexes, and of any age from seventeen onwards, the characteristic common to them all being inexperience and intellectual helplessness. Most of these correspondents desired to pass some examination. A few aimed, or professed to aim, merely at self-improvement, or what they called culture. Starkey, of course, undertook tuition in any subject, to any end, stipulating only that his fees should be paid in advance. Throughout the day, his slave had been correcting Latin and Greek exercises, papers in mathematical or physical science, answers to historical questions, all elementary and many grotesquely bad. On completing each set, he wrote the expected comment sometimes briefly, sometimes at considerable length. He now turned to a bundle of so-called essays, and on opening the first could not repress a groan. No, this was beyond his strength. He would make up the parcels for post, write the half-dozen letters that must be sent today, and go out. Had he not sixpence in his pocket? Just as he had taken this resolve, Someone knocked at the sitting-room door, and with the inattention of a man who expects nothing, Topham bade enter. "'A gentleman asking for Mr. Starkey, sir,' said the servant. "'All right, send him in,' and then entered a man, whose years seemed to be something short of fifty, a hale, ruddy-cheeked, stoutish man, whose dress and bearing made it probable that he was no Londoner. "'Mr. Starkey, M.A.?' he inquired rather nervously, though his smile and his upright posture did not lack a certain dignity. "'Quite right,' murmured Topham, who was authorized to represent his principal to anyone coming on business. "'Will you take a seat?' "'You will know my name,' began the stranger. "'Wigmore. Abraham Wigmore. Very glad to meet you, Mr. Wigmore. I was on the point of sending your last batch of papers to the post.' You will find, this time, I have been able to praise them unreservedly. The listener fairly blushed with delight. Then he grasped his short beard with his left hand and laughed silently, showing excellent teeth. "'Well, Mr. Starkey,' he replied at length, in a moderately subdued voice, "'I did really think I'd managed better than usual. But there's much thanks due to you, sir.' "'You've helped me, Mr. Starkey, you really have, and that's one reason why, happening to come up to London, I wish to have the pleasure of seeing you. I did really want to thank you, sir.' Chapter 3 Topham was closely observing this singular visitor. He had always taken Abraham Wigmore for a youth of nineteen or so, some not over-bright but plodding and earnest clerk or counterman in the little Gloucestershire town from which the correspondent wrote. 
it astonished him to see this mature and most respectable person. They talked on. Mr. Wigmore had a slight West Country accent, but otherwise his language differed little from that of the normally educated. In every word he revealed a good and kindly, if simple, nature. At length a slight embarrassment interfered with the flow of his talk, which, having been solely of tuitional matters, began to take a turn more personal. Was he taking too much of Mr. Starkey's time? Reassured on this point, he begged leave to give some account of himself. "'I dare say, Mr. Starkey, you're surprised to see how old I am. It seems strange to you, no doubt, that at my age I should be going to school.' He grasped his beard and laughed. "'Well, it is strange, and I'd like to explain it to you. To begin with, I'll tell you what my age is. I'm seven and forty. Only that, but I'm the father of two daughters, both married.' Yes, I was married young myself, and my good wife died long ago, more's the pity. He paused, looked round the room, stroked his hard felt hat, Topham murmuring a sympathetic sound. Now as to my business, Mr. Starkey, I'm a fruiterer and greengrocer. I might have said fruiterer alone, it sounds more respectable, but the honest truth is I do sell vegetables as well. "'And I want you to know that, Mr. Starkey. "'Does it make you feel ashamed of me?' "'My dear sir, what business could be more honourable? "'I heartily wish I had one as good and as lucrative.' "'Well, that's your kindness, sir,' said Mr. Wigmore, with a pleased smile. "'The fact is, I have done pretty well, "'though I'm not by any means a rich man. "'Comfortable, that's all.' I gave my girls a good schooling, and what with that and their good looks, they've both made what may be called better marriages than might have been expected. For down in our country, you know, sir, a shopkeeper is one thing and a gentleman's another. Now my girls have married gentlemen. Again he paused, and with emphasis. Again Topham murmured, this time congratulation. One of them is wife to a young solicitor, the other to a young gentleman farmer, and they've both gone to live in another part of the country. I dare say you understand that, Mr. Starkey? The speaker's eyes had fallen. At the same time, a twitching of the brows and hardening of the mouth changed the expression of his face, marking it with an unexpected sadness, all but pain. "'Do you mean, Mr. Wigmore,' asked Topham, "'that your daughters desire to live at a distance from you? "'Well, I'm sorry to say that's what I do mean, Mr. Starkey. "'My son-in-law, the solicitor, "'had intended practising in the town where he was born. "'Instead of that, he went to another, a long way off. "'My son-in-law, the gentleman farmer, "'was to have taken a farm close by us, he altered his mind and went into another county. You see, sir, it's quite natural. I find no fault. There's never been an unkind word between any of us. But he was growing more and more embarrassed. Evidently the man had something he wished to say, something to which he had been leading up by this disclosure of his domestic affairs. But he could not utter his thoughts. Topham tried the commonplaces naturally suggested by the situation. They were received with gratitude, but still Mr. Wigmore hung his head and talked vaguely, with hesitations, pauses. "'I've always been what one might call serious-minded, Mr. Starkey. As a boy, I liked reading, and I've always had a book at hand for my leisure time, the kind of book that does one good.' Just now I'm reading The Christian Year, and since my daughter's married, well, as I tell you, Mr. Starkey, I've done pretty well in business. There's really no reason why I should keep on in my shop, if I choose to, to do otherwise. I quite understand, interrupted Topham, in whom there began to stir a thought which made his brain warm. You would like to retire from business, 
and you would like to, well, to pursue your studies more seriously. Again, Wigmore looked grateful, but even yet the burden was not off his mind. I know, he resumed presently, turning his hat round, that it sounds a strange thing to say, but, well, sir, I've always done my best to live as a religious man. Of that I have no doubt whatever, Mr. Wigmore. Well, then, sir, what I should like to ask you is this. Do you think, if I gave up the shop and worked very hard at my studies, with help, of course, with help, do you think, Mr. Starkey, that I could hope to get on? He was red as a peony, his voice choked. You mean, put in Topham, he too becoming excited, to become a really well-educated man. Yes, sir, yes, but more than that, I want, Mr. Starkey, to make myself something, so that my daughters and my sons-in-law would never feel ashamed of me, so that their children won't be afraid to talk of their grandfather. I know it's a very bold thought, sir, but I thought if I could... "'Speak, Mr. Wigmore,' cried Topham, quivering with curiosity. "'Speak more plainly. What do you wish to become? "'With competent help, of course, with competent help, anything is possible.' "'Really?' exclaimed the other. "'You mean that, Mr. Starkey?' "'Then, sir?' he leaned forward, blushing, trembling, gasping. "'Could I, could I get to be—' a curate topham fell back into his chair for two or three minutes he was mute with astonishment then the very soul of him sang jubilee my dear mr wigmore he began restraining himself to an impressive gravity i should be the last man to speak lightly of the profession of a clergyman or to urge any one to enter the church whom I thought unfitted for the sacred office. But in your case, my good sir, there can be no such misgiving. I entertain no doubt whatever of your fitness, your moral fitness, and I will go so far as to say that, with competent aid, you might, in no very long time, be prepared for the necessary examination." The listener laughed with delight. He began to talk rapidly, all diffidence subdued. He told how the idea had first come to him, how he had brooded upon it, how he had worked at elementary lesson books very secretly, then how the sight of Starkey's advertisement had inspired him with hope. Just to get to be a curate, that's all. I should never be worthy of being a vicar or a rector. I don't look so high as that, Mr. Starkey, but a curate is a clergyman, and for my daughters to be able to say their father is in the church, that would be a good thing, sir, a good thing. He slapped his knee and again laughed with joy. Meanwhile, Topham seemed to have become pensive. His head was on his hand. Oh, he murmured at length, if I had time to work seriously with you, several hours a day, Wigmore looked at him and let his eyes fall. You are, of course, very busy, Mr. Starkey. Very busy. Topham waved his hand at the paper-covered table and appeared to sink into despondency. Thereupon Wigmore cautiously and delicately approached the next thought he had in mind. Topham, cunning fellow, at one moment facilitating and at another retarding what he wished to say. It came out at last. Would it be quite impossible for Mr. Starkey to devote himself to one sole pupil? Chapter 4 Mr. Wigmore, I will be frank with you. If I asked an equivalent for the value of my business as a business, I could not expect you to agree to such a proposal. But, to speak honestly, my health has suffered a good deal from overwork, and I must take into consideration the great probability that, in any case, 
Before long I shall be obliged to find some position where the duties were less exhausting. "'Good gracious!' exclaimed the listener. "'Why, you'll kill yourself, sir, and I'm bound to say you look far from well.' Topham smiled pathetically, paused a moment as if to reflect, and continued in the same tone of genial confidence. "'Let us consider the matter in detail. Do you propose, Mr. Wigmore, to withdraw from business at once?' The fruiterer replied that he could do so at very short notice. Questioned as to his wishes regarding a place of residence, he declared that he was ready to live in any place where, being unknown, he could make, as it were, a new beginning. "'You would not feel impatient,' said Topham, "'if, say, two or three years had to elapse before you could be ordained?' "'Impatient,' said the other cheerily. "'Why, if it took ten years, I would go through with it. "'When I make up my mind about a thing, I'm not easily dismayed. "'If I could have your help, sir.' "'The necessity of making a definite proposal turned Topham pale. "'He was so afraid of asking too much. "'Almost in spite of himself, he at length spoke. "'Suppose we say, if I reside with you, "'that you pay me a salary of... "'Well, two hundred pounds a year?' "'The next moment he inwardly raged. "'Wigmore's countenance expressed such contentment "'that it was plain the good man would have paid twice the sum. "'Ass!' cried Topham in his mind. "'I always undervalued myself.' "'It was late that evening when Starkey came home. "'To his surprise he found that Topham was later still.' In vain he sat writing until past one o'clock. Topham did not appear, and, indeed, never came back at all. The overworked corresponding tutor was taking his ease at the seaside on the strength of a quarter's salary in advance, which Mr. Wigmore, tremulously anxious to clinch their bargain, had insisted on paying him. Before leaving London he had written to Starkey, apologizing for his abrupt departure. The result of unforeseen circumstances. He enclosed six penny stamps in repayment of a sum lent, and added, When I think of my great debt to you, I despair of expressing my gratitude. Be assured, however, that the name of Starkey will always be cherished in my remembrance. Under that name Topham dwelt with the retired shopkeeper, and assiduously discharged his tutorial duties. A day came when, relying upon the friendship between them, and his pupil's exultation in the progress achieved, the tutor unbosomed himself. Having heard the whole story, Wigmore laughed a great deal, and declared that such a fellow as Starkey was rightly served. But, he inquired after reflection, how was it the man never wrote to ask why I sent no more work? That asks for further confession. While at the seaside I wrote, in a disguised hand, a letter supposed to come from a brother of yours, in which I said you were very ill and must cease your correspondence. Starkey hadn't the decency to reply, but if he had done so, I should have got his letter at the post-office. Mr. Wigmore looked troubled for a moment. However, this too was laughed away, and the pursuit of gentility went on as rigorously as ever. But Topham, musing over his good luck, thought with a shiver on how small an accident it had depended. Hmm, had Starkey been at home when the fruiterer called, he would have had the offer of this engagement, with the result that dear old Wigmore would have been bled for who knows how many years by a mere swindler, whereas he is really being educated, and for all I know may some day adorn the Church of England. Such thoughts are very consoling. End of chapter 12